This morning, I'm going to start a new series that's kind of an old series in a sense because we began January with um, what I believe the word of the Lord was for us this year, this no holding back, no holding back. I'll read that scripture to you in a minute. Um, but I'm going, to st- I'm going to start before I get into um, the things in which, you know, I believe God's really kind of calling us into, especially as we end this season of our church's life, really. You know, we, 13 years ago, we began six and a half years. We we're in a school. We came in here the second Sunday of September of 2013 um, and then out, have outgrown this pretty, pretty rapidly at the time and still had to kind of stay put and wrestle through and save money and all that kind of stuff. And uh, we find ourselves kind of in a middle and a transition, and we're going to talk about this idea of middles and, and the mess that middles cause, the mess that you find yourself in the middle of, and how really to fight through that, how to fight through and finish strong. Um, the passage in, in Isaiah that I believe the Lord was calling us to at the beginning um, is from Isaiah 54, and the context is... Um, Israel is still in kind of captivity. So this, this is a word that comes. It's an encouraging word that comes while they're in their own kind of middle. All right? And the word was, enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch your tent curtains wide. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your stakes. For you will spread out to the right and to the left. Your descendants will dispossess nations and settle in their desolate cities. Do not be afraid you will not be put to shame. Do not fear disgrace. You will not be humiliated. This is a corporate vision. It's also an independent, individual vision. The, 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 the admonition is to enlarge the vision. And that, the way I see that is to, to see more. To see more. To stretch your faith. Believe more. To lengthen your reach. Reach more. And then strengthen your resolve. Dig in. Don't be dissuaded. It's easy to get weak in the middles. More, more people finish, start stuff than finish stuff. Fear is a big component that has to be overcome to start anything, but fear also has to be overcome in order to finish something. When I mention this idea of middles, here's how I define middle so we're all working off the same page. The middle is the place where the mess is the greatest and our strength is the lowest. So you can find yourself in the middle, and it might not even be the middle yet, right? I mean, if if we knew there was a chronological beginning and a chronological end, it would easily be be able to say, oh, here's the middle. Very very rarely do we get in stuff like that, right? Very rarely is there a, a, a clean start time and a clean end time. So the middle is when the mess is the most, but our strength is the least. How do you fight through the middle mess in order to finish strong? We've got a lot of great biblical um, stories, characters, um, his, historical people. See, even when I say character, you, you, you look at sometimes, you look at especially Old Testament people, and you go, oh, well, we see them through superhero eyes, like, like somehow they were the ancient Avengers, and, and there's no way that we could ever measure up to who they are. The fact of the matter is, most of the time, these were very ordinary, nothing extraordinary at all, except when you look and you see what they accomplished, the amazement isn't can't really be linked to them. It's linked to God and their faith. That faith is movement. Faith is obedience. And we look and we see how they moved and how they obeyed. And that's what gets our attention to go, man, I wish I could walk through like they walked through it. And the fact of the matter is we can. And their stories get recorded because they're a part of history, but also for the very fact that we can look back from history, we can see how they push through and we can say we can push through, not just because they did, because they even give us this path of how to push through. Nehemiah is where I'm going to start today. A little precursor to history is Nehemiah comes at a time some hundred years after uh, Jerusalem has been ransacked for the first time. And um, Persia, Babylon comes in and they, they sack Jerusalem. They destroy the walls, the gates, the walls. 
They destroyed the temple, the altar, and it lays in ruins for 70 years. And everyone's in captivity for that 70 years until a man named Zerubbabel. And Zerubbabel leads the first wave of exiles out of Babylon and leads them back to Jerusalem. And the first thing they rebuild is the altar. That is an amazingly significant thing to understand. That, that when, when you come out of periods and times of captivity, the first thing we rebuild is our worship. How we approach God. And then Zerubbabel also laid the foundations for the new temple. Then approximately 20-some years later, Ezra leads the second wave of exiles back. And that set with those present rebuild the temple. And then about 13 or so years later is when Zerubbabel leads the last wave out of captivity and they rebuild the walls and the gates. But Zerubbabel had a, um, he had a pretty uh, amazing job as an advisor to King, the King Artaxerxes. Now, Nehemiah was born in captivity. He never knew Jerusalem. Okay? There was a lot of people that were born in captivity. They never knew anything other than Babylon. And in fact, through the three waves of exiles coming back, there was a total group that just stayed. Life was good. They made life there. No problem. They're going to stay put. Nehemiah was one of those. I mean, he had a great job. He, he, had, he had survived and thrived in this new culture. But when he had heard reports of how his countrymen were still without security and identity there in that city with no walls and no gates... He feels compelled by God to go and to rebuild these gates and walls, all right? And so that's the precursor to the story. So I want to pick up the story uh, at all places. We're going to pick it up in the middle since we're going to talk about middles. There's Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 1 through 3 begins this way. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews and in the presence of his associates in the army of Samaria, he said, What are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? Tobiah, the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, What they are building, even a fox climbing on it, would break down their wall of stones. Sembalat and Tobiah represent countries, regions, areas that Israel would have displaced in another generation. Animosity always then resides with them. And so they're the first to speak up because they don't want to see this done. When they see this done, then Israel's, Jerusalem's going to be protected and they don't want to see that. They are very, very angry. If you picked up on that, they were very angry um, and they were greatly incensed. Um, the Jewish people's identity would be restored, and that's what they were angry about. And I want to teach you something about spiritual opposition. All spiritual opposition is sourced by anger over identity. So the mic drop happens in the first few minutes of the message. You can check out after here. All spiritual opposition is sourced in anger over identity. You can worship anything you want to worship. In plenty of our culture, we worship ourselves. Okay? You can worship anything you want to worship, dedicate your time to anything you want to de de dedicate your time to. But once your identity is in Christ, once your purpose is his kingdom, all spiritual opposition then is connected to fighting your identity. Okay? So there's three different ways this ridicule comes about, or at least what I've kind of identified as three different things that get attacked with this ridicule. First is the identity. The second is their ability, what they can do, what they're made of. The third rests around the resources, what they had to work with, all right? So spiritual opposition begins with this ridicule. This ridicule is what really kind of fuels this, the, the, kind of the anxiety around, around the middle. Um, let me just give you a little sidebar that I've come to this conclusion here recently um, on the idea of how do you handle criticism, okay? Um, have, have you kind of grown up in this leadership culture that says there's always some truth in criticism? And this is what I've learned, that there's always some kind of truth in criticism. So that's kind of what makes the criticism hurt so much because you recognize the truth. What, what makes this ridicule hurt so much is there's some, maybe some truth in it. 
You know, these are people that didn't make it in Babylon, but now they're here, right? There's maybe some truth in it, but let me teach you something I've, I've had to learn. That although there might be some truth in criticism, criticism doesn't come from your friends. Criticism is meant to take you down a notch or two, and I don't want to be around people that are critical. Now, a critique is something that comes from someone who loves you. It comes from a different place. It has a different purpose. Hold those people close to you because they'll speak truth to you, but they'll speak it in love, and that critique is meant to change you and strengthen you. Critics do not have that. They do not have that agenda. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time trying to find the truth in the criticism I'm going to hang close to people that love me enough to tell me the truth, critique me, but stand with me. And I encourage you to do the same thing, all right? Because ridicule can tear you down, all right? And that's what they're going to deal with. And spiritual opposition will come. It comes first as ridicule. So how do you come against this kind of ridicule? The only way to combat lies is with truth. Okay, there's a proverb that says the first to present their case will always seem right. And then until they're cross-examined, all right? So after this series, I'm going to do a series of lies we hear and the truth that drowns them out. And I'm going to ask, actually ask you to help me by writing down some of the lies that you hear so, so often echo in your head so we can talk about the truth that drowns out those lies. And the first lies here is all around this idea of identity. Um, now, how do you counteract that? Here is... Um, here is a verse of scripture, 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Um, your, our identity doesn't come from what we do or what we can do or what we accomplish or can accomplish. Our identity will always come from who God says you are. So look at what he says that we are. Look at just the adjectives for a minute. You're chosen, royal, holy, special. Got to love those adjectives. He wraps the identity around this. You're a people. Your priesthood, a nation, and a possession. And then he sandwiches in here our purpose. That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wondrous light. So, so you can see why our identity, gets, our identity gets ridiculed and attacked. Because if we live our identity, then we're proclaiming light into darkness. And if words can shut us up, words are what's going to be used to try to shut us up, okay? So that's the idea of identity. Here's the second lie, is the lie is around ability. Ability. He said, well, if, you know, a fox crawls up on that wall, it's going to collapse. It's attacking their ability. But just like our identity doesn't rest in who we are, it rests in Christ. See, Sambalat and Tobiah didn't do enough research. God consistently used weakness, his people's weakness, to display his strength. So, so being weak here is not the issue because we're, when we're weak, Paul even tells us that that's when we're strong in Christ. So just like that our, uh, our identity doesn't rest in what we can do, our ability doesn't rest in our own creativity. It's not rooted in our creativity. It's rooted in strength in Christ. Here's, here's I'm going to go around my elbow to get to my wrist here, but listen to Philippians. So, some of you know the expression. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition and thanksgiving, present your request to God. What does this tell me? It's telling me the writer's in the middle. Okay? And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. 
Now jump to verse 10. He says, I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever my circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Look, even in the middle. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, and then here's where he drops the mic. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. I learned this is a ten-finger prayer. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So, so, so my strength, my creativity, my ability to, to, to work through the messes of middles, it, it's, not, it's not all on me. It's not all on my shoulders. It doesn't just rest firmly with me. It rests with Christ. And I read something else this week in Romans that really grabbed my attention. I've read it a hundred times. I can quote it. But when, when he said that we, Paul said we should be joyful in hope. And I started thinking about that. What, how, how Joyful in hope, what's that about? When do you need hope the most? In the middle. You need hope when you don't see an outcome. Okay? So he's telling us to be joyful in the middle. Joyful in hope. Then he says, patient in affliction. Nobody's patient in affliction, naturally. When we're afflicted, we want the flick to be over, right? <laughs> and you're going to rush to get it done. He said, be, be, be patient, be joyful in the middle, be patient in the middle. And then he t- t- tells us that our, pr- and to our prayer should be faithful, faithful in prayer, that we don't give up in prayer. Listen, I know what it feels like to pray for something you don't see happen. You're not alone in that. Here it becomes the beauty of Hebrews 11 through all of lifting up these iconic superheroes of Scripture. But it identifies many of them as they did not receive what they had hoped for. But it says they were looking for a city not their own. Joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. It's, it's not about what you can physically or intellectually or emotionally or creativity apply to your middle problem. It's about the strength that we find in Christ. Paul amazingly said, I have, I have learned. To learn something means you didn't know it ahead of time. I've learned to be content even in the middle. I've learned to be content when I've had plenty. When I haven't had enough, I've learned to be content in the middle. Listen, you know, the, the old adage, don't let them see your sweat. Don't let the enemy see you panic. I mean, it, it doesn't matter per se, but I'm, I'm just, you're not going to push, you're not going to push my buttons. We're capable in Christ. That's the truth. Here's the left. They talked about the ridiculed, the resources. Um. Sam Bayan and Tabala said the rocks were, were dead rocks. Why were the rocks dead? A couple reasons. One, the rocks, you know, a rock is a rock for a purpose, not just a rock. Right? So the rocks there were made to be a wall. So the rocks were no longer in a wall. So they're not living out their purpose. So you could say they were dead. The second reason why they said they were dead was because they said they were charred. They were burnt. So the easiest way, if there was an easy way, to, to sack a city wouldn't have been necessary to breach a very fortified walls. It would be through the gates. All right? And so if a gate could be put on fire, then the fire would burn at such a consistency and heat that the keystone that was holding all the rocks up of that gate there, that keystone would crumble. All right? And when that keystone crumbled, then all the rocks around the gate would crumble, and that would leave you the headway to get inside and so, so even a city wasn't considered fortified, even if it had a wall, if it didn't have gates. Okay, one of the first things that an enemy would do would be try to either destroy the gates or take the gates off and take them somewhere else. You can read that in Scripture and other places. And so, again, this, this criticism, this ridicule saying, these rocks, that you can't do anything with them. Here's what's amazing to me. Nehemiah was a planner. Now, I'm a planner. I make plans for my plans, okay? And they're not always good plans, but I can, I'll make them. All right? And I can list them out. And, um, and so 
Nehemiah was a planner, and so he goes to Artaxerxes, and he asks for timber. He asks for safe passage. I mean, he spends his time collecting all the resources that he thought he would need to go and finish this task. And you know the one thing he doesn't, he, two things he doesn't ask for, it's interesting to me. One, he never asks for any stones. He doesn't, he doesn't ask, ask access to any quarry. And he doesn't ask for any masons to come with him. Now, some of our building here is Tennessee Limestone, some of the new buildings, Tennessee Limestone. And there will be like six guys chipping limestone for four hours for two guys to lay it for 30 minutes. I mean, that's how much of an art and, and labor intensive it is on the stone. And at no time, you read, you read all the families that get involved in putting, building those walls, and you don't read anybody that's a general contractor, and you don't read about any masons. In fact, there's one group you read about that's kind of funny, perfume makers. When they list all the families and all the occupations that are bakers and all, perfume makers took their own section of the wall. It was the best smelling section of the wall. Each section was about 250 feet. And yet the only group of people that did not get involved building these walls, politicians. It says nobles, but I'll, I'll translate it politicians. The, the religious elite and the nobles, they were the ones that said, it's amazing how many people tell you you can't do something while you're doing it. We sing about, we sung about this idea of a living stone and Jesus being the cornerstone. He was rejected. He was not considered to be the cornerstone and yet he turns out to be the cornerstone. And then Paul writes and tells us that we are living stones. So this one goes deep to identity when the enemy tells you you can't. You don't have the ability. We look at our past. We look at our failures. We look at our weaknesses. We look at our fears. We look at a whole lot of things before we ever get our feet and our hands engaged in the kingdom, engaged for the kingdom in our own lives. We're easily intimidated because we don't have everything. It's not all working out the way we thought it was going to work. You get to a certain age and you look back and you go, my life wasn't what I thought it was going to be. What do you do then? That, those are messy middles. That's, 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 when, that's when there's more debris laying around you than stuff that's put together. It is where you become the weakest. It's where you're most susceptible to the ridicule. But the way that you combat ridicule is with the truth. That's not true. It's not true. And once you start facing the ridicule of truth, the enemy's anger ups its game and it turns into plots. And this is where we have to engage in prayer. So in Nehemiah 4 and 5, here comes the prayer. Hear us, our God. We are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. That's a pretty good prayer. You're, you're not, you're, that's not a poetic prayer. Um, that's an emotional prayer. It's a pointed prayer. I mean, too many times I think we see prayer, we don't see it as much of an active force that prayer is, really is. Prayer is not a passive response. And when you pray, it doesn't have to be passive. I mean, I don't suggest calling fire down from heaven on your next enemy, but in some cases, it seems to be just a fine request. Turn their in. Hey, they're out after me. Turn it on them. But prayer has to be accompanied by movement. Now, I don't know why people print phrases on dish towels and sell them, but apparently tourists buy them all the time in downtown, Right? There's one I read that I can't even share. It's one of the funniest I ever did, but I've told, I was told it, I couldn't share it from the pulpit. So if you want to hear it afterwards, you can ask me, but apparently I can't do it from the pulpit. But, but, but there's one that I read. There's one that I read that said, um, get on your knees and pray, then get on your feet and work. I loved it because Nehemiah 4.6 says after all, so you get the ridicule, first three verses. You get his prayer, the next two verses, and this is verse 6. So we rebuilt the wall till it reached half its height for the people worked with all their heart. They prayed, they got to work. They prayed, 
They got to work. Listen, you can't talk your way out of a middle mess. But you can pray and work your way out of a middle mess. But you're not going to talk about it. You're not going to talk your way out of it. You're not going to just stare at it long enough. My dad would ask me, son, I don't care how long you stare at that. That's still not going to get done unless you get up. All right? You, you can talk it to death. You can call everybody you want to call. It ain't going anywhere until you pray. You overcome some ridicule. You pray and you get to work. And so here comes the plot that the ridicule escalates to a plot. Verse 7. When Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and, and the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. Verse 9, here comes more prayer. But we prayed to our God, our God and we posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. All right? Listen, truth, prayer, and then a plan. Again, I tell you, I can make plans, but the best plans come out of prayer. You can try to wrap your brain around how to get out, and you might be able to come up with something that, was, that looks very tenable, but your best plans will come out of prayer. Prayer allows you to see things you can't see. Allow you to see ends that you don't see how it gets to that end. You wouldn't have put that step there because it doesn't make any sense. You, it, 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 there's not a lot. You can't put in, in your logic involved. Prayer allows you the wisdom to see what you can't see naturally. I know there's always this rush to get something done. But movement in and of itself is not progress. Really quiet. Movement is not necessarily progress. So they pray, and then he goes on. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out, and there's so much rubble, we can't rebuild the wall. This is where your, this is where your strength's at the lowest. Doesn't look, there's, look like there's more. You've worked your heart out to get through this. And you, look, and you look and you don't seem like you ever made any progress. I wonder if there's anybody in the room today. Verse 11, also our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we'll be right there among them. We'll kill them. We'll put an end to their work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. It says, therefore, I stationed some people behind the lowest points of the walls, the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. It was a fight. Where does your courage come from in the middle of a middle? It says in verse 14, After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. We also can't source our own courage. Our own courage has major, major limitations. And they had already hit it. They had worked with all their might. They, they, had, they had given everything they had to give. And they got it halfway done. And the opposition and their fatigue started taking its toll. One of my favorite quotes is attributed to um, Vince Lombardi. It said, fatigue makes cowards of us all. When you're tired, worn out, spiritually, emotionally, physically, spirit, you, know, you want to quit. Where does the courage come from? We don't source our own identity. We don't source our own ability. So we don't source our own courage. Remember the Lord who is strong and mighty. We sang about it today. He will fight for us. One of the passages that Chris, if Chris would have kept reading, he would have read that um, the psalmist say, uh, um, How precious are your thoughts, O Lord. How vast is the sum of them. If I were to count them, they would outnumber the sands of the sea. What's he saying? Lord, you, talk, you think about me more times than I can ever even imaginably count. Your thoughts of me. God is our source of our courage. And then he ends. And fight for your families, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. A couple weeks ago, I said that we all long for a purpose, but we settle for a cause. 
Causes are temporary, generally culturally driven. But purpose, a real purpose, is bigger than ourselves. And Paul outlines it to declare to declare the wonders, to declare light since we have come out of darkness. Remember the, who we are fighting for. And here was the result in verse 15. It says, When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to our own work. Sometimes getting ready for the fight is enough for the fight not to have to be fought. Sometimes you still have to fight the fight. And other times, you've already done enough that the enemy doesn't want a piece of that. And, and then in Nehemiah chapter 6, the first words was, the first words in Nehemiah 6, 1, it says, and they finished the wall in 52 days. <laughs> and you read that and you go, huh? All this took place in a month and a half? This is pretty, pretty tenacious, pretty, pretty jam-packed. I mean, Nehemiah spent more time than that in getting ready to go. And in 52 days, the walls get finished. Truth, prayer, and a plan. Here's how you fight through middle messes to finish strong. The passage has a double ring to it. It has a ring for us as individuals, as our families, it has a ring for us as a church. Um, I love when you read Nehemiah 3, how many different families they outline that are working on the wall. Like I said, about 250 foot span. Um, they list everything from perfume makers to bakers. They say that there's daughters and sons. I mean, there are plenty of people getting together to get something, something big done. You know, we're in the middle of something big. I mean, it, it, a couple of weeks ago, it looked like, I mean, I can relate that it looked like there was more rubble than progress. They were, they were running water lines, gas lines, um, and, and power lines on the ground. And we got trapped at the house. They, they, they had tore up, <laughs> tore up the driveway, but we were still people up there. We couldn't even get across the gap. I mean, I, mean, I remember looking at the place and go, this is nuts. We've been at this. I feel like since I was like 12, you know, I mean, we, we've been at this and there is more debris, there's more mess, there's more stuff broken, there's more stuff tore up. I mean, I, I just kind of like was going, are we ever, are we ever going to get through this? And I remember the beginning of the year where the Lord said not to hold back and how fear is what causes us. It is a main culprit of holding back. So there's the double ring where are you holding back? What, what, what has the Lord spoken into your life? Where, where, where is he pushing you forward? Where is he calling you towards? I knew when I met you today, this is probably a good message for you and your family. When you are a kingdom family, there will always be opposition to kingdom work. It'll start with a little yeah, 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 yeah. And it will keep escalating and escalating and escalating because the goal is for you to quit. Stop. Say, that's enough. I'm in a good place here. I don't need to move any further. I found my sweet spot. And all the time the Lord's saying, come on. I don't want you to hold back. Don't hold back what you can see. Don't hold back who you can reach. Come on, strengthen some reserve. Get some backbone. Dig in a little bit. Come on, let's get ready for a fight. And the more you're ready for a fight, as we see, come on up, Jason. Or, yeah, Jason. The more you're ready for a fight, sometimes you don't have to fight. We're always got to get ready for the fight. Where are you right now? Do you find yourself in the middle? And is it a mess? And are you tired and worn out? Yeah, that's kind of what middles are. But remember the Lord, strong and mighty. Because he'll fight for you. He'll fight for you. Get you a good dose of truth in you. 
It's the only way to combat those lies that's com that surface and recycle and recycle and recycle and recycle and recycle. You can't let them continue to recycle without them being confronted. And believe me, don't give in to them. Because they're lies and they're meant to take you down a notch. Get on your knees. Man, I, I know there's plenty of times I don't even know what to pray. Anybody else? You get, you get, I mean, it's, you, what, okay, well, you know why, you, you know why we don't pray when we don't know what to pray? It's because we feel like, okay, I'll, I'll forget you. I feel like it's my responsibility to give God the plan for him to resource and carry out. And when I get lost for a plan, then I don't pray because I don't have nothing to talk about. Well, Lord, I talked to you, but I don't know what to tell you to do. I know I'm not the only one. But boy, prayer isn't meant to give God directions. Prayer is meant to resource my identity again, resource my courage again. For him to tell me it's about him and not me, gosh, do we need that on a T-shirt? We think about everything we're going through, it's about us. It's not always all about us. It's rarely about us. You need your courage source today. You need some strength source today. You need to fight through some middle mess today. More rubble than there is building today. Man, let's go to prayer and let God give you a plan. I mean, Nehemiah was a bright guy. I mean, no doubt, right? He didn't rise to the position he rose to because he wasn't a bright guy. But I don't believe he came out of that prayer and all of a sudden, you know, um, you know, he knew everything because it was him. I mean, he probably looked at that hole in the wall and that low spot. He would probably looked at it for the last 15 days. But he comes out of prayer and goes, oh, there's a low spot. Hey, give me another sword over here. What I love about the work part you keep reading, Nehemiah says him and some people, they never even took their clothes off. What does I tell you? That means when they, when they slept, they grabbed about as much as they could grab, still fully dressed with their weapons still to the strap to the side because they were going to fight through this. Can, can I tell you, there is an end. There is an end to the mess you're in right now. There is an end. Now, it doesn't mean there's not going to be another mess. Okay? But whatever has, whatever has dominated your thinking from the moment I started speaking, identifying what a mess is, there's an end to it. And God will bring you to that end. Don't quit. Don't give in to the lies. We're going to have a time of prayer, and it's just going to be a silent time. But I want you to listen. I want you to, you might have to, you might have to be in the place where you might have to give a little venting like Nehemiah did. But I, I, don't, I don't expect you're going to get a whole plan in this moment, but you might. But if you persist in prayer, you're going to get a plan. We quit and moved here, and we didn't know how we were going to fund anything. But God gave a plan. Father, I pray that you release courage, that you release truth. Lord, that you release pain, doubt. Self-inflicted wounds, other inflicted wounds. And Lord, would you give some next steps? I know that your MO doesn't seem to be giving us complete, detailed, sketched out electrical drawings. Lord, you can give us what's next. 
And I pray that for the men and women and students in this room. Let's take a moment to listen. It's a holy moment, church. It's a holy moment. I know the Lord's speaking to you. the Lord wants some of you to know that you're not walking this alone. The difficulty of the season has not escaped our Father. But you are not alone. All of the resources of the kingdom available to you in Christ. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. As a church, I believe God's calling us to uh, talk about this over the next four weeks on expanding our leadership. Evangelism. You know, the older a church gets, the less it's concerned, or the less, well, let me say it this way. The older a church gets, the more focus a church gets on themselves. And generally, that's around the 10-year mark. It loses the fervency of why it started. There's just get so much just to get done and do. And I believe God's calling us up to Annie on our evangelism. Prayer. He's calling us to up our hand on prayer. Listen, if you if you have a prayer need, there's a number of ways to communicate that. There's a 
There's a section on the website where you can record it. There's every other Tuesday night, there's a group of people that meet here for pray, just for intercessory, just for needs. I'd encourage you, if you're a prayer, or if you want to be, I'll ask you to come be a part of that group. You can't have enough people praying. Those prayers get to us either by on that wall over there or on the website or a phone call or there's there's a, there's even a number that we'll get that directly to people who are, are have already committed to stopping and praying whatever they're doing at the moment to pray. We need more people praying. Uh, every Tuesday morning, our staff meeting begins with prayer and the length of our staff meeting generally is di- di- dictated by how many people we know we have to pray for. If you're a member of Gateway, you have an elder. You might not even know this. That's our fault. But you have an elder, and the elder's specific responsibility is pastoral care. So that you should be able to get a hold of that family at any time to communicate your need for prayer. We get together once a month, and we pray as a group. We go around, we go around the table. What are the needs in your group? What are the needs in your group? What are the needs in your group? And we pray. But I do believe God's still calling us much more beyond reactive prayer to proactive prayer. Paul says many, many times, he says, pray that the message of of the gospel will be received. And then discipleship. The more we chase after Christ, the more we look like him, the more influential we're going to be in our communities, in our businesses, in our church. And then about three months ago, I brought up to you um, something I called Finish Strong. So if you, if you haven't been around Gateway in the last three or four months or even six months, or whatever, how, how do you pay for something like we're doing? Well, one is we say we've saved money for five years. That's one way. Second way is financing. The third way was two different rounds of faith promise. What's a faith promise? That's a, you, you praying and asking the Lord if there's an amount that he would lay on your heart to give over the period of, of three years. And then we did two rounds of that and then um, and it's because so many new people come. And, and then lastly, I looked at it. We're, it's about a $6 million project. It's not anything small. And we were about $235,000 short of being able to dot all the I's and cross all the T's. And I brought that to you as a group. Ask if, if, um, if you have yet to get involved or maybe if you have a little extra, we call it a little extra bite. That number was 235. Well, over th- after three months, the number's down to 100. So thank you. You know, when I look at 100, I think that's still a lot of money. But when you compare 100 to the 6 million, man, we've come a long way. Now, it's not paid for, right? I mean, there's, there's, there's a loan in there. But still, we're about 100,000 100, short. So um, you can go visit the website, gatewayfranklin.com slash finish strong, if you want to take a bite of that apple over the last, next three or four months or if, it's, if it can't do that over the course of the next year or whatever. But... Um, it's a, it's a middle, it's messy, um, it's expensive, but man, we've made, a, we've made up a lot of ground, and I want to thank you for that. We just got a little bit more to go, and um, it's grateful. All of our staff, we're grateful to link arms with you in this project, believing that God has called us to declare the praises of him who've called us out of darkness into his marvelous light, and that's what this is about. Amen. Amen. If you'll stand with us for the benediction. For our guests in the room today, thank you for being a part of our worship service. Um, all of the services are special, but the Lord had something special here in this last moment. I want you to know that, that this isn't a flip a switch and it was a duplicate of the 9 o'clock service. It never is like that. The Lord always has something special for each different group of people in the room. And this was something special for some of you. And you need to hold on to that. And you don't need to let it go. And you don't need to let the first lie that says... Well, I was just emotional or I was just tired. No, the Lord spoke to you. The Holy Spirit was in this room. Amen. If you're a guest, love to meet you right outside these double doors. We have the gift for you right after the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine on you, be gracious to you, and grant you peace. And you're rising up and you're laying down. You're going out and coming in both now and forevermore. God bless you. Enjoy your Sunday afternoon.